But when did you first become fully aware of the complexities of the South African oh, society? Oh, when I was about 14 or 15 years old. Was that when you had your sort of political awakening? Well, you know, I mean, it's uh, these things don't... I didn't suddenly up and join some political party. Indeed, there wasn't one that could have um, satisfied that awakening because they were all segregated. But um, slowly I began to look with new eyes at the world I was living in, the way I'd been brought up, the way whites lived. I lived in a small mining town. And um, until I was 20, 21, and went rather late and briefly to university in Johannesburg, I'd never met any blacks um, with the same interests and who, on the same level of education, blacks to whom I could talk, you know, um, on the same level. So I had assumed that as a child that all blacks um, were so different that they, black children didn't go to the same school. I went to a common school, there were no black children there. Blacks lived in a segregated township. Blacks couldn't use the library, they couldn't go to the cinema. And as a child you take over your parents' attitudes and values. I assumed that this was um, the nature of things. As a white South African opposed to apartheid, how would you like to see political change come about in South Africa? Well, naturally, I'd like to see it come about peacefully. Um, that's already in the past tense because it's coming about now and it isn't, it isn't peaceful. One can only hope, as Bishop Tutu says, to limit the violence. When you think of that, 14 years of war in Rhodesia for nothing because Zimbabwe was going to come about. And if you go to Harare today and you see people walking around with you know, an arm cut off here, crippled on one leg and all the, the uh, destruction in the countryside round about, must we, can we not learn from this? But these changes that one reads about, like uh, the elimination of passes and uh, all sorts of changes are coming about slowly. Uh, but you have to read the small print. Mm -hmm. The Immorality Act, fine. First of all, it, it, it uh, affects about 1% of, of the people. But where are you going to live? You have your black wife, or well, I have my black husband, and now it's not illegal. We won't be, be arrested in bed together with your, with your wife or husband. But you can't come and live next door to me with your black wife, because mine is a white area, and you, the white husband can't go and live in Soweto because that's a black area. So there's, you see, when you start dismantling the apartheid, it's really a great tangle. And when it comes to the pastorals, I mean, this was something everybody's been longing for for so long. But again, it's so complicated because the past laws are lifted and if that means you should have freedom of movement. You say, right now, I haven't got to have a pass which says I've got to work in Johannesburg. I want to go and work in Durban now. I'm off to Durban. But you're not allowed to go to Durban until you can prove that you've got accommodation. But I'm white and I can go and live anywhere I like. So it's not as good as it sounds. It's a small, so what is called incremental change, but it's such a small increment. Yes. But don't you feel that looking at America, where only in the 60s there were problems that were very much mm. similar to the problems of South Africa, if you remember books like To Kill a Mockingbird and all those wonderful uh, books about the South that, that really impressed a lot of people. Um, they had a very similar situation and I, I think today, after not many years, uh, things have more or less um, settled down, even though they still have problems oh, in yes, America. But you see, in America there were two colossal differences. One, that in most states, if you wanted equality for blacks. The law was behind you. You were imposing the law. You had to fight prejudice. In South Africa, if blacks want equality or you want it for them, you are running, you are defying the law. That's a very big difference. Yeah. And secondly, in America, the population is a minority black population. And with us, it's exactly the other way around. Mm -hmm. Four and a half million whites out of roughly 30 million people. Mm -hmm. Many people outside um, Africa fail to understand the complexities of the tribal system in South Africa. 
Um, for example, in Zimbabwe, there's a lot of bloodshed between the various tribes. Do you think this might happen in South Africa too? No. Or is it happening? You see, in South Africa, this question of tribal differences is something that people outside the West, people in the West, um, governments who support the South African government, either covertly or overtly, they play up. In South Africa, over 60 years, blacks in South Africa, the tribal system has been broken down by industrialization. It's been a hard school indeed. The, the, the quick growth of industrial centers, bringing labor from all sorts of different tribes everywhere, living in these black ghettos together. I mean, there are well over a million people in Soweto alone, and that's only one township. And there are people from all tribal backgrounds. There's only one danger, and that is indeed the um, KwaZulu, this concentration of what was once Zululand, mm -hmm. and people were pushed back into this Bantistan, and now you have um, Magasuta Butulezi, who is um, the beloved of um, so many people in the West who see him as the moderate um, but is he black, a, is black he leader. A and I think he represents mm -hmm. great danger mm -hmm. because um, although he hasn't taken complete independence, um, he's got his little power base there. He's got his own private army, mm -hmm. which very often um, beats up people who don't quite follow we don't quite uh, support Butelezi strongly enough. And uh, I'm afraid that when change comes, as it will, I don't know whether he'd be prepared to be part of a unitary South Africa, whether he wouldn't want to hold on to that little power base. The other Bantu stands, it really, you know, it's, they're of no account. The, the leadership is not of the uh, calibre of uh, Butelezi. But I yeah. think Butelezi is a danger. Um, it's been stated that Stephen Bosak and Mandela are among your personal friends. M Mandela's name is often put forward as a candidate to lead a majority rule in South Africa. Mm. Yet some observers say, well, they have cynically suggested that his greatest service to the liberation movement is probably to remain in jail because he provides a focal point for it. Mm. First, do you think that the government will release him? And second, what do you think would happen if it did release him? Well, I'd just like to comment, first of all, on what you said a little earlier. I think it was true until perhaps a year ago, 18 months ago, that Nelson Mandela, sadly for him, his, his greatest service to the cause that he's given his life to indeed was to be that focus in, in prison. But I think that's no longer true, and now it's of vital importance that he should come out. Do you think this will ever happen? Absolutely of vital importance. Well, I begin to think not. I think what the South African government tried very hard to do and didn't work was um, to divide the leadership of the ANC. You may have noticed if you followed the, uh, the various debates that have gone on, various speeches that have been made, that recently there was a suggestion that there are two camps in the ANC. The one is the communist camp and the other is the more reasonable camp. And I think what the government would have liked to have done would be to let Mandela out, but not all, not everybody else with him. Now Mandela won't come out unless, unless his fellow, yeah, fellow are released. Out. And he and he dare not take any any such a deal, you see, because he must keep the, the movement united. Yeah. But it's terribly, terribly important for him to come out mm -hmm. because um, at the point at which insurrection is going on, on in South Africa now. There is a danger that young people, some of whom last this last year have been to school perhaps one month in the whole year. And when I say school, I mean all, all levels of school. And sometimes people are 21, 22 years old because they can't afford to go to school as we do right through. You work for a while, you go back and so on. And these young people are getting used to directing their own campaign of liberation, so to speak, which is really a dangerous thing. Isn't there compulsory schooling for black children then? No. 
And I think you need the central figure, not only in Mandela and on the others, to direct these energies. Because there's a danger that young people get so used to uh, the, the bit of power that they gain for themselves. But, um, Could be. You can't control it yes. after. Um, it might be a problem after majority rule. Yes. And also, a more important question is that the bloodshed shouldn't go on. And I think only, uh, only the presence of Mandela and his lieutenants would stop, stop it. that. Uh, but of course, the government has to stop its violence mm -hmm. first. The government yeah. always says Mandela must renounce violence. Mm -hmm. But the government doesn't offer to renounce violence. Mm -hmm. What future do you see for whites in a majority rule South Africa? It depends entirely on the whites. Um, if it's going to be a majority rule South Africa, the majority of blacks support the African National Congress. And the ANC has never been and is not anti-white and doesn't visualize a South Africa without whites. It has gone to, it, always, it's gone to almost extremes so that it is attacked by the, by the, uh, the separatist blacks to keep up relations with whites. It's always had whites involved in its, um, in its um, hierarchy of leadership, quite, quite high up. It's always cooperated with whites. And um, there's no question of whites being driven into the sea if the ANC is going to be the, the prime mover in the, um, in the future South Africa. So one does but I think if you are white, um, what are you? are you? Do you want to be part of a, a white separatist group with special protections or do you want to be a white African? I think that the future for whites is to be white Africans you have really sincerely to accept the fact that it is, it was a black country, that there's a black majority there, and that one is going to live under black leadership. Whites have been used so long to running everything, to deciding everything, to having everything to themselves. Um, it's been like a big country club. <laughs>